Okay, so I'm uh, somewhat somewhat inebriated on New Year's Eve, but I'm also like alone. I don't have friends or anything because, you know, coronavirus uh, and all that. don't want to kill grandma. So uh, I just figured I would uh, drunkenly recap the plot of The Expanse so far for everybody. And like there's spoilers and stuff, but I think I'll, uh, when, when I'm sober, I'm editing sober, don't worry. Uh, I'll split it up into like di different sections. So it'll be like book one, book two, and all that. And I'll and I'll talk about the TV show a little bit too, but like because they mostly follow each other. But like I'm, I'm just gonna book one, book two, all that. So like in book one section, I should only spoil book one and all that. And I'm just gonna summarize the plot of the Expanse. Let's see if I can remember. Let's go. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Okay, so the Expanse is like this world. It's a couple hundred years in the future. We don't know, uh, we, we don't know the exact year, but uh, we don't need to know it. It's like in the future, and humans have this thing called the Epstein Drive, which allows them to get their ships going a lot faster than we have today, but um, not like light speed or anything. So they've colonized most of the solar system, but they haven't gone beyond that. And anyways, we got this guy, uh, his name is James Holden, and he is like, he used to be a, a member of the Earth and Navy, but now he's like just a guy who works uh, on a water hauler. Like it's a ship that goes out to Saturn and like gets ice from its rings and then takes it to uh, the asteroid belt. Because there's a bunch of people who live in the asteroid belt. They're called belters. Uh, like th there's three th factions basically. Earth, uh, Mars, and the belt, which is basically just the asteroid belt and the outer planets. Like there's tons of people out there who are super poor and shit. And uh, he's there, he, they find his distress call, so they send a ship out to go check it out, and then a ship that was hiding out in the middle of nowhere, it has like a stealth thing, it shoots a missile and destroys their whole ship along with the water, and only a couple of people who were on the ship that went to, in the smaller like lifeboat that went to investigate, survive. And it, it seems like Mars did it, so like, Everyone in the belt is super pissed because, like, they've been oppressed by Earth and Mars for generations. They're super poor and stuff. and But Holden and them, they, they don't know what's going on. So there's like, oh, what's going on? And then meanwhile, we're following this detective on Ceres, which is, like, the biggest asteroid in the belt. It's it's a city in, uh, in, in the Expanse world. But in our world, it's actually just a really big asteroid. It's technically big enough to be con considered a dwarf planet, actually. That's kind of cool. But uh, he's there, and he's investigating some, like, murders and stuff. And he, and he's looking for the daughter of this uh, wealthy dude named Jules Pierre Mao. Her name is Julie Mao. And she uh, hooked up with this faction of the Outer Planets Alliance, the OPA. And they're these... Basically, they want the, the belts to be independent from Mars and Earth. Uh, or, well, the belts and the Outer Planets to be independent from Mars and Earth. But, like, it's split into a bunch of different factions, so, like, some of them are just straight-up pirates or terrorists, and others of them are, you know, actual political figures and stuff. They're, they're kind of like the IRA, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. You know, the IRA, you got Sinn Féin, you got the Provisional IRA, just stuff like that, you know? Anyways, Julie Mao was up to some stuff with them, and then she vanished, so Miller's trying to track them down. And, um, basically Holden gets caught by a, by a Martian warship because they're like, hey, you made it sound like we destroyed your ship. We didn't destroy your ship. But then other, like, stealth hiding ships come up and destroy their ship. And uh, Holden and them escape and they take this uh, warship called the Rocinante, which is super state-of-the-art and all that. But it's, um, you know, it's legitimate salvage. It's not stealing. But, you know, some Martians are still pissed because they're like, they stole our warship. They didn't steal your warship, bro. And Holden and them go to this uh, faction of the OPA, and they wind up hooking up a little. They're like, "Hey, let's let's help each other out because we don't no, none of us want to get shot." And then they wind up going looking for Julie Mao as well. And then basically, them and Miller wind up in the same place on this station called uh, Eros, which is also uh, an asteroid in the belt somewhere. And uh, basically, Julie Mao is there, and she's dead. She's she, she, she's dead. She was killed by some sort of uh, weird virus thing that they don't understand. And they, like, leave as soon as they can because they don't want to get infected. Uh, but then other dudes show up and they fake some sort of emergency and they herd everyone on the station into these uh, 
like shelters, basically. Uh, but little do they know, they actually threw Julie's body in there, and whatever virus she was infected with infected the rest of them, and they filled it with radiation and shit. So the virus goes crazy, and the people, like, actually start coming back to life as, like, zombies and shit, but they're also, like, not quite zombies, but kind of zombies. And then they all manage to escape, and they're like, whoa, what the hell's going on there? And so they managed to track down this, uh, th this uh, other group, which was working with whatever the virus or what weapon, whatever was, that they were uh, using to, to kill Julie and all that. And uh, they track them down, they capture the station where it was, and it turns out this uh, company called Protogen, which was actually owned by Jules Pierre Mao, who is Julie's father, uh, they were the ones who discovered it on uh, Phoebe, one of the moons of Titan. And they, they discovered it. That's the thing. They didn't invent it. It was actually an alien artifact. It turns out that Phoebe was just a rock that some aliens put the thing on. They call it the proto-molecule. They put it on, and they just threw it towards Earth, but it somehow caught, got caught up in Saturn's gravity, and so it became a moon. And so... Uh, it just infects whatever living thing it is. They don't know what it's for or what it could do, but they were trying to experiment with it. And anyways, they, they kill most of the scientists. Miller actually kills one of the scientists and kind of pisses off everybody else. But, like, the dude kind of needed kind of needed to die, so it's understandable. And also, everyone on Eros is dead, and they don't want anyone, like, getting infected with the protomolecule and spreading it. So they're like, okay, we're just gonna get a ship going real, real fast and smash it into the the asteroid and then send it on a course where it'll hit hit the sun and just burn up. And so they try doing that. Um, and Miller actually gets stuck on the station while it's there. and Because and, he's like kind of suicidal and stuff. Like Thomas Jane does a really good job of playing him in the show. So Miller gets stuck on there and he's like, okay, I'm about to die, but it's okay. And then just as the ship is about to uh, hit it, the, sh the asteroid just moves. Like, there's no thrusters or anything, it just moves, because turns out the proto-molecule makes the laws of physics a bitch. Like, they just do whatever, whatever they want. I'm trying not to be extra while I'm drunk, I'm sorry. But, uh, the proto-molecule, yeah, just does whatever it wants and doesn't understand us. And then, uh, because Julie Mao is kind of in control of it, she says, I want to go home, and so she starts heading towards Earth, and Miller manages to find her, and he convinces her, hey, let's not go to Earth, we can't go there, we'll kill everybody, so let's go to Venus. And so it crashes into Venus instead. And uh, that's that's basically where book one ends. Book two is Caliban's War. That one actually starts with uh, this um, Martian Marine named Roberta Draper, but everyone calls her Bobby because Bobby sounds cooler. And she, um, ba basically, she's, she's on uh, Ganymede, one of the moons of Jupiter, which uh, Earth and Mars still hold in conjunction because it's super important and they uh they haven't given it up to the opa yet because the opa has managed to gain control of a lot of the belts in our planets over the course of the first book and um uh, bobby and them uh notice that these earth marines are like running away from something and they're like hey what's that and then the, they think the earth marines attack them so they start shooting and then it turns out it's actually this humanoid thing which is infected by the proto molecule but she doesn't know that at the time and then uh, it it self destructs, and and Bobby's entire squad is killed. Uh, but uh, them shooting at each other causes a war, so like other Earth and Mars ships start destroying each other in orbit and shit. Meanwhile, James Holden and the crew of the Rocinante that that's the ship they that's what they named their Martian warship that they took the Rocinante. That that was a uh, Don Quixote's horse actually, which is kind of a weird obscure name, but like cool whatever. And anyways, they um. They've been, like, hunting down pirates and stuff for uh, the OPA, which is that's cool. That's honest work and all that. But Holden's also kind of a dick because, you know, he he has not quite PTSD, but he's, like, freaked out from the protomolecule stuff because they're like, oh, there's aliens out there and we don't know anything about them or what they want. And their thing is on Venus and it's, like, doing stuff. We, we've been watching it. We don't know exactly what's going on, but it's doing stuff. And, and anyways, Holden's kind of a dick, and eventually that gets him fired from the OPA, but that comes later. This is also where we uh, get introduced to an Earth politician named Christian Avasarala, who is Indian in the books. She's played by a Persian lady in the show, which, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm white, I don't have a dog in that race. And, like, on one hand, the actress does a really good job 
But on the other hand, like, maybe we should just have people of that race pe play people of that race, but like, eh, wh whatever. Also, race is a social construct. It's, it's not that important, I don't think. But anyway, she's on Earth, and she's trying to deal with, like, the fallout of uh, the Eros incident, and, like, trying to rein in the OPA, and try and, pre and like, you know, Earth and Mar Mars are kind of at war now, so she's trying to help prevent that, uh, or wind that down, you know, that sort of thing. And anyway, she hears about Bobby and her squad and everything, and they get brought to Earth to, like, or, or rather, she gets brought to Earth to, like, just, just, um, testify and give her account of what happened and all that. Then there's also this guy on, uh, Ganymede named Praxidike Meng, 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 M-E-N-G, Meng, because the, because space is colonized by the world. It's not colonized by white people, and, you know, you got, like, Indian people and Chinese people and all them and like actually most of Mars has an East Texas accent even though a lot of them are like Indian in descent so like that's kind of funny actually and anyways Meng's daughter had uh, went missing like because during the battle dur during um during all the fighting between Earth and Mars like there some like satellites and shit just crashed down to the to the surface of the moon and destroyed a bunch of stuff and his daughter went missing and he assumes she's dead but then it turns out she's out she was actually kidnapped by someone for some reason and it turns out they were actually working with protogen and they're doing experiments with the proto molecule we don't know about the experiments until later at least not in the books in the show they tell us pretty early on but anyways we they, they she was kidnapped and so he winds up on a refugee ship and then he hooks up with holden and the crew of the Rocinante, and they're like, hey, let's go look for your daughter, and so they do. Meanwhile, on Earth, Avasarala and Bobby, uh, they go out into space, because uh, Avasarala and Bobby both know something fucky is going on. Like, it, it seems at first like, okay, Earth started shooting first, therefore it's their fault, but at the same time, Bobby tells them about, like, the protomolecule creature, and no one really believes her. Uh, anyways... And her and Avasarala agree to talk to Jules Pierre Mao. Remember, he's in charge. And um, they, they they go out into space to, like, his private yacht. Because he's super fucking rich. He has a yacht, but instead of a boat, it's a spaceship. That's that's really cool, but, God, I'm jealous. But anyways, they, they go out there and, like, oh, it's a trap. People uh, in Christian's Earth government are uh, in, in league with... <laughs> People in Christian's Earth government are in league with Protogen, and they're doing experiments. Because, like, y you know, you could maybe do crazy stuff to humans and the human body and allow for space travel outside of the solar system and stuff. That that would be kind of cool. But a anyways, they're, they're in league with that, and they try and capture her and Bobby, but they fail. And her and Bobby run off in a racing uh, ship that they capture, and... Um, they managed, while they're running out, they managed to run into the Rocinante along with Holden and Praxidike Meng and all, all the others. And they're, they're like, hey, they meet up and they're like, hey, some shit's going down. And they're like, oh, yeah, some shit's going down. That's that's, that's crazy, dog. And anyways, they, eventually, long story short, they go to Io and they rescue Meng's daughter and they, they arrest Jules Pierre Mao and like that. That, that's it. Day saved, happy ending, all that. Except for the ending, because that, that bit at, at uh, where the protomolecule and Eros crashed on Venus, it wasn't hurting anybody, because no one lives on Venus, but, like, it was building something, and then at the end it comes out, it's a big ring, like, a couple kilometers across, comes off of the planet, and then just goes off into space, and they don't know what it's for or what it's doing, but it, it goes off into space. And that's the end of book two. Book three is called Abaddon's Gate, and that one, the ring that came off of Venus, just parks itself uh, outside the the orbit of Uranus, like Uranus, like the planet, and it's just it's just out there. It's not doing anything weird, they don't think, but they have all these ships parked around it, and they're looking at it and checking it out, like oh, there's something weird going on there, and then some uh, some some dipshit kid from uh, from the belt who just like has has a has a ship and they're, they're doing this weird sport like slingshotting where they you, you know they have to calculate everything and then they like fire off and then they orbit around jupiter and stuff and they have to calculate everything so that they 
hit their target with like the least amount of fuel and air and everything uh, possible. And it, it, whatever, it's a sport. And anyways, he aims for the ring and uh, they have a blockade around it and everything. So they're like, hey kid, go away. And he's like, okay, I'll go away. But he's actually not going away. And anyways, he hits the ring and as soon as he goes through it, it activates. It's a wormhole and it actually kills him when it activates. But yeah, it's a wormhole and it leads to this big space like outside of space like extra dimensional or something which is a space full of there's this big space station in the middle and there's a whole bunch of other rings just like the one they came through which are they, they lead to somewhere who knows anyways every major military faction in the belt or in the solar system you know so the earth the belt mars they all go there and they check it try to check it out and it's like well there's something fucky going on here and anyways, Jules, Jules Pierre Mao's other daughter, who's Julie Mao's sister, who remember is dead, uh, her name's Clarissa, she hates James Holden because, like, he exposed her dad's crimes, even though her dad committed all the crimes. James is just the one that exposed them. And uh, anyways, she hates him, so she, like, blows up a ship that was in the fleet and then blames it on him, and so he has to flee into the ring gate. And then they go in there, and it's like this... You know, it's this alien space, like I described, and a bunch of other ships come after him, and they're like, whoa, there's some weird shit going on here. And then Holden goes to... Because, like, remember, this was all built by aliens. They don't know anything about the people who built this, whether they're hostile, where they are, what they're like. And Holden goes to the space station there, and he's actually accompanied by the ghost of Miller. Now, remember, Miller was the detective dude who died on Eros, but... Uh, it turns out the proto-molecule sort of assimilated him, and then in order to communicate with Holden, it's, it just uses the, uh, the hallucination, essentially, of Miller. Like, it's a hallucination of Miller. It, like, pokes his neurons in the correct order and all that, and it makes him see or, and hear stuff. But anyways, it uh, communicates with him using Miller, and he's like, hey, we need to find out what happened to the people who built me. And Holden's like, okay, let's go. And they go to the space station. There's nothing there. Everyone there is gone. And basically, it turns out the people who built the ring gates, uh, they're usually just called the builders or the proto-molecule creators. And anyways, they were around and they built all this shit. Like, they, they took the long-term uh, form of colonizing where they would just take a big rock and put proto-molecule on it and then hurl it at a planet which had life. And then it would just assimilate all that life and, you know, build ring gates. That was its purpose. And a a anyways, they were around for a long time, but two billion, that's B, billion with a B, years ago, something came around and killed them. And so they tried uh, cutting off all the ring gates, like, to prevent its spread, but it didn't work. And so they all, they all died. And so all their shit has just been sitting around for a couple billion years. And Holden's like, whoa, that's crazy. And then some more... Uh, shit goes down in the ring gates, which is kind of, it, it's cool. It's cool. The third book is the best, in my opinion, but it's not that important, really, in the grand scheme of things. So basically, some shit goes down, they manage to fix it, and then they open all the other ring gates. So there's like 1,300 new gates, which lead to new worlds, uh, which is really cool. It's good for humanity and all that, but at the same time, there are, <laughs> well... The, wh whoever built these is dead, and they have technology far beyond our own, and something killed them. And we don't know what's going on there. And that's the end of book three. Book four is Cibola Burn. Now this one starts off with, like, this group of uh, belters, or not not even really belters, they're, they're outer planets people. They're from Ganymede originally, which is... It, it, I don't know, the word belters only really works for people from the asteroid belt, but, like, people from the outer planets... They're also kind of belters, physically, culturally, all that, but, like, they aren't part of the asteroid belt. It's kind of weird. But anyways, they they managed to go to a planet through one of the ring gates called Ilus or Elus? I think they say Elus in the show. I always read it as Ilus. I'm not sure. Anyways, they go there, and they start their own, you know, uh, little colony, little business and all that. And it's pretty great for the most part, but because they grew up in such low gravity, some of them just can't adapt, and so they, they cannot live on the planet. It, it, it sucks, but like they, they just can't do it. But at least they, people on the surface have their own colony, and they're making money and stuff. That's, that's pretty cool. 
Uh, but then there's also this group of uh, Earth scientists from a corporation who was given rights to like study the planet and everything who come there and the Belchers think they're going to take it over so they become terrorists and they just blow them up. Like, <laughs> I mean, I understand not wanting to give up what you've take what you've rightfully stolen, but like the Belchers there are terrorists, let's be honest. Anyways, there's a big conflict going on there because a bunch of people die because again, terrorists. And, uh, but, but also the head of the Earth security is this guy named Murtry, who is a psycho. He's played by one of the scientists from Pacific Rim. I don't remember his name, but he's the one who's not Charlie Day, but dude's a psycho. And so, um, Ava Saral, remember the, uh, politician from Earth, she sends Holden and his crew over there to mediate and shit. And they mediate, and, but while they're also, while they're there, the protomolecule with, like, the ghost of Miller protomolecule also... Uh, wants Holden to investigate some of the shit going on on Eilis. I'm gonna call it Eilis. That sounds better. It wants him to investigate some of the stuff going on on Eilis and uh, just, you know, figure out what happened to the builders because he, he, he's basically a computer program and he doesn't know. And so while Holden's there, he the situation between the Belters and the Earthers escalates a little uh, and then this big crazy thing happens. He... Uh, activate some of the protomolecule technology which is on this planet and then there's a big explosion and a tsunami and all that and also its technology just makes the laws of physics stop working so their ship drives won't really work in orbit and uh, they all have to hide underground for a little while but then uh, Holden manages to go over to this other area where he can shut down some of the technology and he sees this big like floating orb which is a leftover from whatever or whoever killed the protomolecules and again we don't know what it is it's basically an unexploded bomb but it's it's whatever killed them and so they managed to use it to shut down all the technology I hit the wall they shut down all the technology and the the day is saved you know the earthers and belters work together they manage to solve the problem everything's great uh but then in the epilogue it turns out that avasarala wanted holden to fail because the, like the the story he winds up getting is that like oh they the inners and the outers managed to put aside their differences and work together to tame this new alien world and so now there's this whole new frontier out there which she thinks people are just gonna go to without thinking and a bunch of them are gonna get killed and it's gonna cause a lot of problems and so she's like, well, shit, he, he succeeded the one time I don't want him to succeed. And that's, uh, that's, that, that's the end of book four. Book five is called Nemesis Games. Now that one starts off uh, not that long after the Rocinante's crew got back to our solar system. And they are getting their ship repaired and stuff. But every member of the crew kind of has their own business to deal with. So like one of them, Naomi, Holden's girlfriend... Uh, finally makes contact with her son, who she kind of abandoned like 15 or 16 years earlier when he was just a baby. Uh, and so she has to go and see him. And the pilot, Alex, has to go back to Mars to kind of make amends with his ex-wife and stuff. Because, uh, you know, he kind of sort of abandoned her. Because he's kind of an asshole when you think about it. Like, Cass Anvar gave that character a lot of charm and charisma and all that but then it turned out that Cass Anvar is also an asshole so I'm not sure how that works out and then there's a guy named er uh, and then there's a guy named Amos who's from Earth and the woman who raised him his kind of a surrogate mother died and so he's just going back to take care of her some of her stuff and Holden just kind of stays behind with the ship while it's getting repaired and meanwhile uh while all this has been going on after they went to Eilis a whole bunch of people realized oh, hey, there's all these other planets out there. Why should we stay in this solar system? This solar system sucks, so let's just pack up and leave. Which, while it is good for the individual people who are able to start a new life, it's not great for the governments they left behind, particularly Mars. Because, you see, Mars, it, they're trying to terraform it, but it's not... It, it takes generations upon generations to do it. They have to, like, make a magnetosphere, and then they have to make an atmosphere, and then they have to put an ocean out there, and they have to fill it with, like, bacteria and shit. Uh, at least I think that's how they do it. They don't go into a lot of detail in either the book or the show. But either way, they have to do all of this work. 
But by having this one big project that their citizens can build towards, they're able to foster this sense of patriotism and ha uh, they're, they're able to build up this really big, powerful economy. But then, like, suddenly a whole bunch of their citizens leave. I think in the book they mentioned it's like a fifth of their citizens just leave the planet over the course of a couple of years, which is a huge deal because, again, that was one of the big military powers of the solar system. So their economy collapses, their government is destabilized, and their military has to downsize a lot. They have to get rid of a bunch of their equipment and stuff. Uh, and over the course of the book, we learn that that equipment, a lot of it got stolen and got sold to a radical faction of the OPA, Outer Planet, Planets Alliance, led by this guy named Marco Inaros. Now, Marco Inaros uh, runs a faction of the OPA, which he calls the Free Navy. And basically, he, he and a lot of others like him saw Mars's economy collapse when people realized they could just go to the other worlds through the ring. Uh, and they realized that belters don't really have the same economic niche that they used to have because most of them grow up in low gravity, so they don't really have the option to go to these bigger planets. A lot of them just cannot adapt. It's It sucks, but it's how it is. And um, so he realizes we're going to go extinct if we keep this up. So he and his faction, which they call the Free Navy... Wait, did I say they call it the Free Navy already? I don't remember. But... Uh, they just coat these big asteroids in Martian stealth tech and get them going really, really fast, and they throw them at Earth, and they hit it, and it kills literally billions of people, and it destroys... It just, it just, it's a bad time for everybody. And then he comes out and says, Yo, Earth and Mars, you control your own planets, but everything else is controlled by us, and no one's allowed to go through the ring gates anymore. And then people just try to deal with that for most of the rest of the book and eventually the crew of the Rocinante gets back together and they're like okay so shit now what and then that's the that that's the end of book five book six babylon's ashes is just a continuation of the fight against the free navy because you know they're gonna take over everything if you let them and so we gotta take care of them before they're getting their before they get their footing and everything and so they basically that's the most of the book they go off and fight them and marco and uh, he, he see he's a charismatic leader is the thing but he's not a particularly intelligent leader so like every time he loses or anything he makes it seem like that was his plan all along and so they even though they're driving uh ships that were stolen from mars or bought from mars depending on who you ask because they in this book and somewhat in the first book, you find out that they actually bought all this decommissioned uh, technology from Mars from this uh, admiral named Winston Duarte. Duarte. That's Every time I read that, I think it says Duterte for a second, and I'm very confused because I'm like, what the fuck does he have to do with this? Isn't he president of the Philippines? But, like, whatever, whatever. They... they they go through all this, and also while it's happening, peop it turns out ships that go through the ring gates are just disappearing. Like, like just out of nowhere. No one knows what's happening to them. And uh, so, basically, uh, the forces of Earth and Mars push the Free Navy back further and further and further, and the crew of the Rocinante goes uh, to the ring and into the ring space, and they manage to take it back from the Free Navy, who had uh, taken it earlier, and uh, Naomi, while she's looking through some of the records and stuff, she realizes that most of the ships that disappeared disappeared when, like, energy had spiked really high while the ships were going through various rings. And she realizes, okay, so all we have to do is put a whole bunch of other ships through it right before the Free Navy comes through. And so that's what they do. And so Marco and his friends all just disappear when they go through. And then they're dead. And that's the end of it. And... They, they realize, though, that Marco did have a point when he's like, okay, Belters are going to straight up go extinct if we, if we uh, continue on this current course. And even if they don't, even the ones that don't die out are just going to be way too poor to live. So how do we deal with this? And so they come up with a compromise. They create this thing where they, they create this agreement where the Belters and the Outer Planets people they will be the ones who control all transport between solar systems. So, like, they're the ones that control the ring space, and they're the ones that control 
commerce and everything between every other space. And like, okay, that's, that's, yeah, all right. That's, it seems weird to give a job to one race of people, race, pseudo race. I don't know. Like I said, race is, race is a social construct. And so what we think of race of as race and what they think of as race is different. Like, you know, a hundred years ago, the, the Italians and the Irish weren't white, but now they are. So, okay, whatever, whatever. What. It seems weird to give one race of people uh, that kind of control over such a important economic thing. Because, like, that's what the Jews had for many hundreds of years, and that didn't work out super well for the Jews, but... Okay, it is a fitting compromise for the time being. And anyways... Babylon's Ashes, cool book, cool war story, that's the end of it. Book 7, Persepolis Rising. This one, weirdly enough, jumps forward 30 years. Yeah, it's it's just 30 years later. So it turns out that Winston Duarte and his big chunk of the Martian Navy and a bunch of other people that he was able to convince to go along with him just left their system and went to what one of the ring worlds called which they call laconia which like real subtle winston real subtle that laconia was the name of uh the area around sparta back in ancient greece like or lacedaemonia d depending on the translation i think or the dialect something like that but anyways uh, laconia yeah that was that was the area around greece like the people or no, the, area around, the area around Sparta, like the people of Sparta were usually referred to as Laconians. So clearly they think a lot of themselves. Anyways, they've gone there and they've like built up their own planet civilization and everything. Uh, they have a sample of the protomolecule, which they use to experiment on people. It's a total dictatorship. Uh, Duarte runs it, excuse me, by himself. And he's having experiments done on him to make him, to make himself immortal. Which, uh, like, he, he kind of has a point when he says it. He's saying, like, I, he, he's a philosopher king. You know, he doesn't need to deal with, like, popularity contests or board of directors or Congress or anything like that. He's just, he's just going to run shit by himself, and he'll be the best at it because he's just, he's just the best. But at the same time, he's not going to have to worry about, like, his son or anything taking over and fucking things up because he'll just be in charge forever. Because, again, he's just he's just the best at it. Anyways, he and his ships announce that they're coming through, and everyone in the rest of human space is like, okay, they're just some banana republic. They, they don't have particularly powerful ships or anything. Whatever, we'll take care of them. No, it turns out their main ship is crazy alien technology stuff that they built, because that's why they went to Laconia, is because there were orbiting platforms around it, which were built by the, the by the proto molecule builders, and they they were used they used that to create these powerful, crazy awesome awesome ass ships, and they come in and they just completely fuck everyone to pieces. The Earth Navy, the Mars Navy, the Transport Union, and the Belters like just everyone is fucked. They have no way of standing against these things, and uh, over the course of most of the book, Laconia kind of sort of conquers everything because like the soul the soul system which where we live where earth and everything is that that's still where most people live and where most of the economic activity is and everything uh and they conquer that but they also conquer the ring space which leads to all the other worlds and so they're like yeah we we're in charge now what of it and so the crew of the rocinante obviously isn't just gonna sit back and take it uh but they uh they um they 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 try and take like guerrilla tactics and shit, and they managed to steal a small uh, Laconian warship, which is also, like, super advanced and shit, and they managed to take off with it. Uh, but during all of this, James Holden is captured, and he's actually dragged away to Laconia, and when they use one of their weird weapons, it kind of turns everyone in the soul system off. And what I mean by that is, like, every human being just at the exact same time passes out and i don't mean like there was an epicenter and people passing out spread out at the speed of light it was instantaneous which is crazy in terms of physics at least it was, it was absolutely nuts and it seems like whoever or whatever destroyed the protomolecule creators not only are they the ones that are 
eating the ships that go through the ring gates too fast, but they are the ones that shut humanity off for a couple of minutes. And when Holden gets to Laconia, he's like, yo, guys, what the fuck? This, this is, this is your fault. You're fucking with things you don't understand. You're going to get us all killed. Uh, and then the other crew members take the, uh, not the Rosinante, the, the ship they stole and hide it somewhere. And they're like, okay, we're going to be the, the leaders of the resistance. And then that'll be it. That's on to book eight. Book eight is called Tiamat's Wrath. And this one, by the time this one starts, Laconia rules over everything. It's a total dictatorship. Uh, Winston Duarte rules everything himself. And there, there's still a lot of people who are pissed about that. And so there's an underground resistance and everything, but they cannot meet the the, the military in open conflict because they, they tried. And even with a bunch of warships and everything, it just completely fucked them to pieces. It's, they, their technology is too is too great. What are you going to do? And um, in, including Winston Duarte's daughter, who is also getting the immortality treatments, which seems to suggest that Winston doesn't just think that he's above everyone else. He thinks, well, no, he thinks he's above everyone else. That's That's the gist of it. He and his daughter both get to be immortal. Why? Because they're special. It, it's not really fair, but uh, his daughter also is not really rebelling, but she really doesn't like her father and the control in her life and everything. And so she's meeting up with this guy named Timmy, uh, who's hiding off in the wilderness, and he, he's pretty obviously Amos from, from the beginning. We can tell that, but, like, you know, he's hiding off in the wilderness, and he's like, yo, your dad kind of sucks. And she's like, yeah, my dad kind of sucks. And Holden's held prisoner. And he's like, yo, your dad kind of sucks. And she's like, yeah, my dad kind of sucks. Meanwhile, Naomi is kind of sort of helping to run the resistance. Like, you know, she they have to be like really secretive about it and, uh, and everything. But yeah, Naomi is helping to run shit. She's helping to conceal information and all that. And she's getting information to where it needs so that they can disrupt Laconia and they can uh, do damage to it whenever possible. It's still not great, but, you know, whenever possible. And eventually, uh, some of her old friends in the Resistance managed to steal some antimatter bombs from the Laconians, and they use them to blow up one of their ships. Now, the thing about uh, blowing up their ships is that they only have, like, three of them. So when you blow up one in the Soul System... That's when, and they, they have to keep one in Laconia at all times, and they have to keep one in the ring space at all times in order to control everything. And so they realize, oh, uh, shit, we don't have one in the soul system anymore. And so if people decide, like, oh, okay, let's rise up, they won't have, they won't be able to do much against it, which is exactly what they were counting on. And so, long story short, they managed to just get a bunch of other people in the rebellion together. They actually take a bunch of battleships that were taken apart into a bunch of pieces and reassemble them. And they manage to take back the ring gates and then they go to Laconia. And even though their ships are way more powerful, they the resistance just has so many more of them and they can get resupplied and everything. And so they're, they manage to, you know, <laughs> fight them really well. And then they... Through a daring maneuver, they managed to destroy the orbital platforms, which they used to uh, create and maintain their alien space technology ships. Uh, and they also managed to rescue Holden, and they take Duarte's daughter with them. And, um... Oh, fuck, thinking is hard. And they win, for at least for the time being. However, while all of this is going on... Uh, Duarte and the Laconians are kind of experimenting and trying to figure out how to hurt or kill the uh, people or the race or whatever that killed the protomolecule builders. And so basically they, they, they investigate it a little, but basically they send a bomb uh, on a ship which will go through the ring gates at the exact moment which they're going to eat everything and then they try and set it off and see if that'll hurt them. And it doesn't seem to hurt them that badly, but it does seem to piss them off because they destroy two of the ring gates. And one gate leads to a solar system full of people who actually live there, and then the, the gate's destroyed, so they're just cut off from the rest of humanity now. Good fucking luck, guys. Yeah, excuse me. But also, during their experiments, the 
creators seem to keep turning people off the way they were before. Like people will just pass out for a couple of minutes at a time. And it seems like they're experimenting with damaging human physiology so that they can wipe us out the way they wiped out the proto molecule creators. And so Holden and other people are like, Duarte, what the fuck are you doing? And uh, Duarte, instead of getting turned off, his immortality treatments involved use of the proto molecules. So they, they seemed to make him kind of like the people who created the proto molecules. So with the treatments, it just kind of destroyed his mind, I think, because he just kind of sits in a chair and babbles to himself now, and he doesn't seem to know what's going on anymore. And that's that's not good. Uh, and also, the their, the creators, they still have the some of their technology running around. And on Laconia specifically, they have these machines running around, and if they catch any people who have died for one reason or another, they will bring them back to life, but they'll bring them back to life slightly different. And while all this is going on, Amos gets killed, but then later he comes back and saves the day, except he's his blood is black now, his eyes are black, and he's his personality seems mostly intact, but we're not totally sure what's going on. And even though Laconia's power is broken, and the power of the uh, Earth and Mars, who were kind of controlling everything still, is also broken, so all the systems seem to be mostly independent, they're... Um, the, the, whoever built the proto molecule, the things that killed them, they really should come up with a name for that. Sometimes they call them the Romans and the Goths, but like the Goths didn't destroy the Romans, guys. That's overly simplistic. But anyways, the Goths are still out there, <laughs> and so they're like, "Well, how are we gonna deal with this? I don't know." And so that's where we are as of the end of book eight, and book nine is the last one. There's one more to go. It's gonna be called Leviathan Falls. The Levi Leviathan Falls, and I'm not sure what's going on, but honestly, the expanse up to this point has been fucking crazy. I mean, most of the books have had at least one crazy thing that has happened and made me go, whoa, what the fuck? The only one I didn't really like was Caliban's War. Actually, Caliban's War and Cibola Burn, to an extent, are both not that great, but even if the storylines aren't that great, the characters and everything are still fun, so like... The Expanse is fun, and uh, I know I spoiled a lot of stuff, spoiled a lot of stuff in my summary, but the characters and action and stuff are still fun, so if you haven't read it, you should go read it. If you don't feel like reading it, uh, watch the show. The show's really good. It's on on Amazon. Uh, anyway, that's it. Bye. Okay, thanks to everyone who watched my ramblings that I insist on calling a career, and especially thanks to all my patrons, and the $10 and up guys are... Apo Savalainen, Eris Targaryen, Ava Toomer, Brother Santodes, Christopher Quinten, Deanna Dahem, Embus, Emily Miller, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Lawrence Hicks, Liza Rudakova, Madison Lewis Bennett, Micah Phone, Rees Yarola, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Vacuous Silas, and Ve Victus. You guys are great, and if you want to get your name anywhere on this list, then consider going to my Patreon and becoming a patron. You know, that's how that website works and all. Like, you get your name on here, you get to vote on video topics, you get to see stuff early, it's, it's, it's great, it's amazing. And if you're too poor to afford that, then, well, I hate you, but as long as you like the video, comment, subscribe, and continue watching my stuff, then, well, you know, I, I'm fine with it. You know, you're, you're okay if you can do that. Anyways, I'll see you later.